get to the goal of the Star Trek replicator, we're progressing in stages. The first stage was computers controlling machines. One step in we're, is we're using machines to make machines. We're making machines that make their own parts. A step in after that is we're making assemblers that build with discrete materials. And then a step after that is we're making programmable materials where there's no machine, where the materials themselves change shape. Now, that isn't time ordered. We're pushing each of those in parallel, but they have very different horizons for applicability. So one step in is we've had to do things like completely rewrite CAD and CAM and machine control because historically the way you design things and then tell the machine how to make it and then have the machine make it assumed those were all separate steps. Um, and so uh, in the very short term we've developed entirely new much more capable ways to describe how to make things to make it easy for a design to go to, to any sort of machine and we're developing all sorts of machines that can make their own parts so rather than buying an expensive machine the machines themselves can make, make their parts. Um, the work we're doing on discrete assembly then, where instead of depositing or cutting, you make assemblers, there, um, boy, there's many different applications. So to give you examples on each scale, on the smallest scale, we have a project using proteins to place engineered materials. And what that's aimed at is for things like, say, a three-dimensional integrated circuit. Instead of a billion-dollar chip factory, we actually want to grow the circuits by coding their construction. And this works a little bit like the way you synthesize proteins, but now we're, we're sort of growing geometry for nanostructures. Um, on the micro scale, the micro assemblers we're developing, to stay with the electronics example, Right now when you make circuits, so, so I first was describing a, instead of a chip fab making the chip, growing the chip, then to make all the rest of the electronics, today you etch traces on circuit boards and solder components. We're making micro assemblers that, that build the electronics out of little bricks of electronic material. And so that means in a single process you can make functional three-dimensional systems and also when you're done, you can unbuild them and, and change them and recycle them by disassembling the materials. And then on the biggest scale, we've been looking at how to make high performance materials for things like aerospace, how to make a jumbo jet. And there, the lightest, strongest airplanes today are made by winding carbon fibers around a barrel. And the tool itself is the size of the airplane, the enormous facilities. What we're showing is by using, again, these, these coded construction, these discrete constructions, you can essentially snap together the airframe of a jumbo jet. And instead of a giant factory to produce it, you can make an assembler that locally assembles it, but builds the global structure. And it turns out the material properties are much better. It's, it's, it's lighter and stronger. It's a higher performance you can integrate all of the control functions, it's easier to repair. And so the, as an analogy, if you think about a child building Lego, the child build a Lego airplane. You build the airplane one brick at a time, locally. The, the child doesn't need a facility the size of the airplane. You're locally placing bricks, but from that you build the global structure. And what we're finding is if you do that at full scale, it actually works much better. And so, on all of these different scales, um, it's digitizing fabrication by actually coding the construction, by putting information into the materials. And that's one of the most important things coming out of the research. Uh, we're running a meeting uh, March 7 at CBA, um, co-sponsored with the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy and a number of government agencies. And that meeting came from there's a number of national initiatives around future manufacturing. And they're largely focusing on the difference between additive and subtractive on 3D printing. And 3D printing has become a, a, an odd sort of meme. It's widely covered, but not by the people who actually do it. Uh, I, I have a the CBA runs a, a digital fabrication facility of one of every tool on every length scale. And the 3D printers are actually one of our least useful tools.
because they're slow, they're fairly expensive, they have mediocre material properties. We have a range of amazing tools that are computer controlled, only one of which is the 3D printer. It's a little bit like telling a chef that the microwave oven is the future of cooking. It, ha it has a role. The real revolution isn't 3D printing. The real revolution is digital versus analog fabrication in, in the sense I'm describing of coding construction. And so the meeting March 7 will gather together researchers going from molecules to buildings, developing this, this sort of new science of fabrication. And um, then a range of government agencies and private sector groups uh, to look at that roadmap. Uh, the whole notion of advanced manufacturing in a very funny way has gotten segregated. Um, to talk about the future of manufacturing, which is obviously an important subject industrially, it's done assuming uh, manufacturing is done by companies in factories and the tools look much like you understand them today, but maybe they squirt plastic instead of cutting. And what's emerging from the work is this much deeper science and in turn, you can line this up very closely. If you look at the history from mainframe computers to mini computers to hobbyist computers to PCs, um, we're repeating that history now where the equivalent of the PC is a personal fabricator, something that makes anything. And in the same way that PCs up into traditional industry, we're also finding the, te the technologies I'm describing radically change uh, industry and education.